All right. Aren't you right. glad that paper's done? Yeah. Move on with your life? <laughs> <laughs> Yay! So, but, oh, so, oh, wait, wait. Oh, it's, it's locked. locked. Come on the other one. <laughs> yeah, it, it's just... Oh, that was heavy. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I don't know why. Yeah. yeah. You need you need a key to unlock that thing. So. Okay. We're gonna miss you too. Abigail Adams. <laughs> Have you ever watched uh, John Adams the miniseries? Really good. Really good. So. Why? Yep, yep, we are just doing one long poem today. And it's a good one. So we're on page 448, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Recording? Is that a way? And, okay. Again, I think we're going to see pretty quickly that the Ancient Mariner is a Byronic hero. So that's why I want to do it right after you. Frankenstein is pretty exciting. Um, but first, do you remember when we looked at Okay, well, we, we looked at Wordsworth's preface to Lyrical Ballads, but first we looked at that short piece from Coleridge where he explained what they were doing in Lyrical Ballads. One was taking something natural and making it seem almost supernatural. Who did that one? That was Wordsworth, good. And then Coleridge took something supernatural and made it seem almost natural. And if you remember, the famous phrase, you probably heard it in high school, the way that, that, that Coleridge was going to do that is that he was going to get from us our what? You know the phrase? Remember? Our something of something something. Our, our something something of something. Our willing... There it is. Our willing suspension of disbelief. And it's not unbelief, but we're willing. In other words, we're, we're so drawn in by the emotional and sort of psychological and spiritual reality of the poem that we're willing to suspend our, we're not going to just throw out our mind, but we're going to suspend our overly logical, rational thing and we're just going to accept it. And like I said, you, you always have to have a little bit of willing suspension of disbelief if you're going to enjoy musicals. And like I said before, haven't you ever met somebody who said, I don't watch it because people in real life don't break out in a song. Yeah, yeah that, that's right. Yeah, I know. That's right. Yeah, so it's just it's kind of a strange double standard, or whatever you want to call it. There, um, but you've just got to accept this. We and we do it, even though we may not believe literally in what's happening. We accept, and ultimately, this journey is as much an internal journey as it is an external journey. It's as much an internal journey into a broken cycle as it is a journey through a strange and terrifying world. And you know, even when we read Frankenstein, we go to all these diff distant places, the Alps and the North Pole and stuff, but we're also, in a way, journeying in the frozen, isolated, twisted mind of Frankenstein and his monster. And by the way, don't you think it's wonderful that the monster has come to be called Frankenstein? I mean, that, that in itself is just fascinating. Uh, that it's got. And in the movie, it's never called. Uh, in fact, in the movie, in, in the credits, it says monster. You know, it just says monster. Um, but again, it, it's just happened that, that we call the monster after his creator. Very odd. Um, so in, in this poem, we're sort of catapulted immediately into this strange world in medias rest, just like the Greek epics and the Greek tragedies, right? It is an ancient mariner. Right, right away, away, you should say, oh, that's weird. You would not expect him to say, it is an ancient mariner. How would you normally ex express that? He is an ancient mariner, or there was an ancient mariner. We wanted, but you wouldn't say, it is an ancient mariner. And it's not just the, 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 the it, the, the making him sound like a uh, neuter, but is, this, this strange use of the present tense. It almost turns the ancient mariner into some kind of higher being. It is. Uh, it is, is almost like, well, what's, what's God's name? I am. Okay. But it, it is the Lord. I mean, it's strange. It's not necessarily what we're deifying the ancient mariner, but he becomes a figure that's almost outside of our world. Um, it is an ancient, it's just like a force of nature that is there. And he stoppeth one of three. Wow. 
It, does, it, does that mean it's weird because that suggests random and arbitrary and chosenness at the same time? Right? One of three. And here, literally, it's going to mean he sees a, a series of three wedding guests going to a wedding, and one of them he stops and the other two go on. Why does he? Later on, we find out he knows who he must speak to. But right here from the beginning, it is, there's a you know, old weird sense of election or chosenness or something like that, but he, he grabs you and you're pulled out. By thy long gray beard and glittering eye, now wherefore stoppest thou me? Now that's the voice of the wedding guest who says that. We don't know that yet. But he stops it. And this young man, what, what are you, who are you? The bridegroom's door are open wide. He's still speaking. The bridegroom's doors are open wide, and I am next of kin. The guests are met, the feast is set, mayst hear the merry din. Why are you stopping? Wherefore stoppest thou me? I'm on the way to a wedding, something wonderful. Hey, I've got to get there before COVID starts. Do okay. you have any friends, friends or family that had to stop their wedding because of COVID? Shame. Some of them just went through and uh, forget it. My parents are going to a wedding this weekend. Oh, boy. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Hey, they're still going to do it. Yeah. We'll see what happens. Anyway, it's going to be the epicenter of a new outbreak. Who did? See? So people are still doing it. Life must go on. Right? Anyway. So, again, let me go. I, I, I want to go there. He holds him with his skinny hand. There was a ship, quoth he. Hold off! Unhand me, gray beard loon. F soon's his hand dropped he. So he holds him, and the witch says, let, let me go. So he drops his hand, but then he grabs a hold of him with something much stronger. He holds him with his glittering eye. The wedding guest stood still and listens like a three years child. The mariner hath his will. Mirror has hypnotized him or mesmerized him. You know what the etymology of hypnotize is? Hypno. What is it? Hey, very good. Are you learning Greek? No, I just got a lot of Oh, good. Okay, good. Hypnos means Greek. And that's very important in the book I wrote, The Dreaming Stone. I get the copy of it. Okay. Does anybody know then what the etymology of mesmerize is? Greek? Is it Latin? Okay, you're going to impress your friends. You may even win Jeopardy someday. Mesmerize, believe it or not, is named from Dr. Mesmer. His name was actually Mesmer, and he invented hypnotism before Freud. Uh, and that's what's going on. Isn't that cool? It's like, it's like he's got the perfect name, Mesmer. You know, it's really wild. You know, it's like calling somebody a Scrooge. It comes from a character. Uh, but here, it's an actual person, Dr. Mesmer. And that's where, you know, Freud got started using it. He made it more famous, right? So he's holding him with his eye. He can't stop the power of it, like a three years child. And if you read your notes, Wordsworth wrote those lines for him. Uh, and listens like a three years child, the mariner hath his will. So he holds on to it, right? And so now the wedding guest becomes sort of passive, but he's also actively receiving they, 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 again, almost like a force of nature where nature impresses itself upon the young Wordsworth say in Tintern Abbey, here he impresses it. And then it says, the wedding guest sat on the stone, he cannot choose but hear, and thus spake on that ancient man, the bright-eyed mariner. Okay, we heard that phrase, he can, we heard a phrase like this earlier in this class, uh, the eye it cannot choose but see, we cannot bid the ear be still, uh, we feel with or without our will. You got it. You were just saying you like that poem. If you, if you have a textbook, you just want to see it. It's on page 297. Um, but it, it's expostulation reply when he says that again. Uh, uh, um, we feel... I the whole thing, but again, the, the eye it cannot choose but see. We cannot bid the ear be still. Uh, we feel uh, within, with or without our will. It's line 17 to 20. Um, that's it. Our bodies feel where they be, with or without our will. And it's really cool because that part was actually written by Coleridge, up at Wordsworth, but, you know, they, they, they both were. And 
Again, probably Wordsworth was reading out loud some of his lyrical ballads while Coleridge was writing it. I mean, there's that give and take, just like between Lewis and Tolkien. You see overlaps, right? The only difference is, is that C.S. Lewis was proud when Tolkien quoted him. Tolkien got upset and Lewis did that. Yes, that's right. And do you know why he spelled it wrong? Yes, that's right. He never saw it. The Inklings always read out loud. So he never actually saw it. He only heard it. That's pretty neat. And it's just like changed everything. This is so cool. Anyway, the, uh, so again, we're, we're still in this world of how we are, we, we are receiving passively the overwhelming power of nature. Or again, in this case, he's almost an embodiment of nature. It is an ancient mariner. The ship was cheered. He's telling him the story now. The harbor cleared. Merrily did we drop below the kirk, below the hill, below the lighthouse top. The sun came up upon the left. Out of the sea came he. You would have expected out of the sea came... No, 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 but what's the he? It's actually a reference to the sun. So you would expect... So by calling the sun a he, it's, again, it's more of that pantheistic touch we've seen. Like all of nature is alive. It's a weird way of saying it. I mean, the sun really isn't it. It's not a he or a she. Uh, I mean, generally, the sun is a he, the moon is a she uh, in Greek mythology. Um, Diana, or uh, what's her other name? Uh, Artemis, well, Artemis, but then uh, Phoebe. She's sometimes called Phoebe, or Selene. Yeah, so sometimes there's different names. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so it's really, really cool. You like your Greek mythology, too. I'm always testing the kids. See, when you took long uh, trips in my family, I'm testing the kids on Narnia, Lord of the Rings, mythology. Did you do that? Yeah. Well, we kind of just grew up in like a picture books, and then not all of our siblings enjoyed the mythology. We did. We had multiples. We had the layers. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Oh, okay. So the book was called Greek Myths, but they used the Roman names of Jupiter oh. and Juno stuff. Oh, and Cupid and Psyche. And oh, it always yeah. confused me. It is confusing, see? And, and you're going to notice, like in this class, it's almost always the Roman names because everybody's getting it from Ovid, who's Roman. The British almost always use the Roman names and Roman stuff for things. Uh, but partly it's because of Ovid. Yeah. Yeah, that's why they always can see it. And of course, you know, yeah, it's, it's, and it's Ulysses in the Aeneid, too. So they're influenced by the Aeneid, Ovid, Dante, talks about Ulysses. Ulysses, that's good. Right? So, uh, again, it's it just this whole idea of he cannot choose, but here, that's that kind of wise passiveness from that same poem, Expostulation and Reply. Um, again, taking in this story. And we, got, we start to hear a fantastic story, right, of this wild ship journey that, and, you know, I, if, if, you, if you were really good, you could probably map this out on a globe. But again, it's really more an internal journey than anything. More of these psychic explorers, like remember when we first looked at Blake's uh, the, the Chimney Sweeper of Innocence, and I said that the, 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 the romantics discovered the unconscious mind it was just later given a scientific nomenclature, but they, they were the first psychic explorers. Wonderful, right? Um, so again, and we even get a refrain uh, later on at line 36 on page 449. Line uh, 36 says, The wedding guest, he beat his breast, yet he cannot choose but hear. He wants to leave, but he's held. But he can't leave. It was good stuff. Uh, uh, as, as they move farther and farther, and notice that most of this story, this poem, almost epic poems. It's, it's the proper name for this actually is a ballad. It's more like a medieval ballad and it even uses what they call ballad rhythm. So it's an epic sea journey but technically it's based on old medieval ballads. Um, and just like Frankenstein, we go to all these inaccessible places from pole to pole, we pass the equator, all of these strange places we've never been to were taken there vicariously through the ancient mariner. Uh, uh, line 51, and now there came both mist and snow, and it grew wondrous cold, and ice mast high came flighting by, floating by as green as emerald. Ooh, that's wild, isn't it? Uh, and through the drifts, the snowy cliffs did send a dismal sheen, nor shapes of men nor beasts we ken, the ice was all between. The ice was here, the ice was there, the ice was all around, it cracked and growled and roared and howled, like noises in a swound, like when you swoon, uh, when you faint or something like that. At length it crossed an albatross, thorough the fog it came, 
as if it had been a Christian soul, we hailed it in God's name. It ate the food, uh, this is actually how British people pronounce it, it ate the food it ne'er had et, that's still how British say it today, had et, and round and round it flew. The ice did split with a thunder fit, the helmsman steered us through. So they were getting trapped in the ice, which is what happens to Walton ship, right, the beginning and end of Frankenstein. It's getting caught in the ice, and then the albatross appears, and it seems like it's a Christian spirit, and suddenly it breaks, and they start moving through it. They do. Now, it, it's usually a dove, but it's a bird. You're right. What they think, it's called the clashing rocks. And it's, it's probably a reference either to the Hellspot or what they call the Bosphorus. But you're right there going, and, and it would come back and forth, clash. And so they sent a bird with a sort of string to see it go through, and then they followed it. So that's interesting. Yeah, it is a dove, usually. Uh, but it is a bird. Now, do you, have you ever seen an albatross? I mean, are pictures of it? I mean, they are the most beautiful. They have a wingspan that's like as tall as I am. Taller. It's like a six-foot wingspan. They are the most perfect aerodynamic creatures. Over their lifetime, they will circle the globe a lot of times. They'll go like halfway around the globe to get food for their kids. They are so aerodynamically perfect, they can fly while sleeping. They just keep, they're, they're the most beautiful, I've never seen one alive, but see, I think I saw a taxidermy one of once and pictures of it. But again, they're, they're just, and they're, they're, they're good luck. Right? They're, so they're much bigger, I mean, you've all seen seagulls and all, but they're much, much bigger and more majestic. Uh, an amazing, amazing bird. Uh, and so it lands there and they, they basically sort of adopt it. And a good south wind sprung up behind the albatross to follow. And every day for food or play, came to the mariner's hollow, they called it, it was like their pet. In mist or cloud, on master shroud, it perched for vespers nine, whilst all the night through fog smoke white, glimmered the white moonshine. Everything seems fine. And then, obviously, the wedding guest, the listener, notices that maybe the mariner's face is tensing up, you know, like, like, a, like, a, you know, like a remembering a bad memory. He says, God save thee, ancient mariner, from the fiend that plagued thee thus. Why looks thou so? With my crossbow, I shot the old. This is his, what? Like the Byronic hero does this. This is his, his unforgivable sin, right? This sort of terrible taboo. It's like like a fall of Adam and Eve, right? Uh, like the plucking of, of the fruit, the forbidden fruit. It kills the albatross. But, okay, you notice along the sides, we have those things written. Do you know what those are called? It's a fancy word for that. They're called glosses. I think it's called a gloss. And those were actually written by Coleridge, but for the second edition. They weren't in the original edition of, of, of Lyrical Ballads. But later on, he added them to help us. Uh, does anybody know uh, what C.S. Lewis book? He added glosses, except he wrote them on the top. You ever read Pilgrim's Regress? Okay. In the first edition, people were so confused that in the next edition, he added... Have you ever gotten an old book like, like of Dickens, Dickens, where on the top of every page it's like a little synopsis of what's happening. You don't, you don't see that modern, but I've always seen in older books used to do it. Yeah, that's right. Some of them will do that. Yeah. I love that. That's neat. But if you watch it, older books, some older editions, on the top will be like a little summary of what's happening. Really cool. Right. Oh. Oh, that's true. That was the Lattimore. Well, that's true. I forgot that. Which is really, but you'll see it in older novels sometimes. But I don't, I don't think anybody does it now. I've not noticed it. But if I don't, you know, go to Half Price Books. Anybody been going to Half Price Books with Corona and all that? We used to go there. I wish we had Half Price Books when I was a grad student. That would have saved a fortune. Because the, the prices are just amazing. So, okay. Now, look at the gloss that, that Coleridge himself wrote next to that uh, stanza. The ancient mariner inhospitably killeth the pious bird of good omen. So, what he's showing us is not only has our mariner, if you might, if you might say it this way, committed a sort of Judeo-Christian sin. He's, he's, he's disobeyed, whatever. But you could say that, that, that Coleridge is allowing us to also see this as a sort of Greco-Roman sin. Because what has he done? 
Yeah, yeah Xenia, X-E-N-I-A. Xenia is the guest host relationship that is so important, particularly in the Odyssey. Uh, it's there in the Iliad, jump the Odyssey. In the Odyssey, uh, it's very, very important. You do not mistreat a guest, right? Uh, if you're a bad host, uh, like the Cyclops is the ultimate bad host who eats his guests, right? Uh, so, again, it, it's just, I think Coleridge is widening it so that it's, in a sense, both Athens and Jerusalem, both Judeo-Christian and Greco-Roman. He has proven to be a very, very bad host. And killed the bird. And it is a senseless crime, as senseless as eating the fruit of the knowledge of good. Every other fruit is there for you, right? Every other fruit. And we know that they, uh, the Garden of Eden was a vegetarian place. So we as Texans know that the fruit in Eden actually tasted like, like a steak. When you ate, right? We know that, right? Yeah, it's like brisket, you know, brisket apples and things like that, right? I mean, it couldn't be paradise if there's no meat, you know? What are you gonna do? Meat? You don't like meat? It's okay, I'll make a lamb. You ever seen my big fat Greek wedding? Oh my gosh, you could, you've seen my, you could, so couldn't that be your, your, your culture too? When you watch that movie, do you like recognize it? A little bit, I mean, I, I, I could see that as, you know, like my big fat Indian wedding or Pakistani wedding or my big fat, uh, uh, well, even Hispanic wedding, I can see it too. Uh, it's, you know, anybody that's sort of ethnic, you can sort of get uh, Irish, I can see it being Irish or Jewish. Uh, or Arab or something like that. It's, it's, it's really funny, but anyway, the, the, the kid who's going to marry the Greek girl is a vegetarian. And, you know, the, the, the Greeks always eat a lot of meat. And he says, come, I'll cook for you. And he says, no, 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 he's a vegetarian. What? Meat? You don't eat meat? It's okay, I'll make lamb. Hey, that's literally, I mean, that's how they'll talk. I remember a friend of mine back in college, you know, when I was your age, this girl was a vegetarian and she said, and, and I hate to go back for, for Thanksgiving and they get on my case. And, and, and she, she told me that one time she said she was a vegetarian and her mother said, turkey's not meat, it's bird. <laughs> oh, you're saying my mind. Very wonderful. She, she didn't buy that one, okay, but anyway. Oh, oh, there we go, yes. Why not eat fish and birds, you know? Uh, God created those in the same day, right? The fish and the birds, right? Yeah. So, you can eat those. Oh, if you won't even eat eggs or something like that. It's amazing. And then if, if you throw on top of that uh, gluten-free, then, then there's like nothing they can eat. Oh, really? Or something. Yeah, that's right. Like meat and vegetable. Yeah, you nothing. There are no cultivated grains. And then there are the really weird people that only eat food raw. Uh, yeah, that, that's just. That's I would think so. Oh, only fruit. Oh, was it? Oh, really? Unbelievable. You know. I mean, the old Atkins diet was meat and vegetables, and if you only eat meat and vegetables, you will actually lose weight. If, if you don't, don't eat any sugar or grains or anything like that, if you just live on, you can even li live on meat and butter and, 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 and vegetables. Without those carbohydrates, you'll lose weight. That necessarily means healthy, but you'll lose weight. But, ah. Yeah, I get, yeah, no, it, 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 it was just, it was a, it was a kind of forbidden crime that he just, there's not even any reason. Yeah, like it's not even helping people like Frankenstein. It's, it's, but in some ways, I mean, I guess Eve has a reason to eat it, but it's certainly an irrational thing to do. Yeah. Right. There's none. We, we never get a motive. Why? Was he just shooting and it was an accident? Yeah. I mean, it seems like he did, he did kill him. Yeah, we're, we're never told. Why? It's, it's just, I, I don't know. That's what makes it scary. Just, I mean, did you ever see a movie called The Fight Club? Very disturbing movie. <laughs> about that, yeah. And uh, there's one part where the guy just gets mad, and there's this, this, this guy who's very pretty looking with blonde hair, and he just goes wild and pummels him, right? And then afterwards you see him, he's all ugly. And he says something like, I just wanted to destroy something beautiful. It's like really scary. I mean, that, that, that kind of stuff that just wants to destroy and, and pull down. Really, really disturbing movie. Good movie, but disturbing. Anyway. Uh, and, and then, then it says, says the, the sun now rose upon the right, out of the sea came he. We're still there, still hid in mist, and on the left went down into the sea. And the good south wind still blew behind, but no sweet bird did follow, nor any day for food or play came to the mariner's hollow. Now it says, 
and I had done a hellish thing, and it would work them woe, for all averred I had killed the bird that made the breeze to blow. Ah, wretch, said they, the bird to slay that made the breeze to blow. So at first, all the mariners are down on him, the other mariners are down on him, saying all these terrible things he did. By the way, the implication is that when he was on the ship, he was a young mariner. But now he's the when he was he wasn't ancient on uh, there he's probably a young man but now you know imagine the, whatever what's his name Ishmael an old old man going around telling the story of Moby Dick or something like that you know uh, so it's clear that a lot of time has passed but anyway it's so at first they turn against him and accuse him but then the important next stanza nor dim nor red like God's own head the glorious sun uprist. Then all averred I had killed the bird that brought the fog and mist. T'was right, said they, such birds to slay that bring the fog and mist. And I think that Coleridge was probably worried that people weren't understanding. So the glosses really are helpful here. First, his shipmates cry out against the ancient mariner for killing the bird of good luck. But when the fog cleared off, they justify the same. In other words, they justify the killing of the albatross and thus make themselves accomplices in the crime. Why do you think Coleridge wanted to make that clear? Because what's going to happen? They're all going to die, and that seems kind of unfair. So, in a sense, they participate in the guilt of the mariner, just as we, and Adam's right, what we call original sin. Right? And it seems to be here a sort of allegory, a metaphor for original sin. They've also participated, they didn't do it, but they've participated in it. So again, it, it adds a wider sort of biblical dimension here. But there's more dimensions. Like I said, the Greco-Romans there, everything. Like, like reading Narnia or something, everything's there. Um, the fair blue, blue, and then it goes on, and all that sort of stuff. They move into a strange new ocean that no one's ever been to, this strange, strange place, right? Uh, and they, they move on, and then it gets, it gets worse and worse, like 111, all in a hot and copper sky, the bloody sun at noon. Right up above the mast did stand no bigger than the moon. Day after day, day after day, we struck, nor breath nor motion, stuck, nor breath nor motion, as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. This is sometimes what they call the doldrums. Did you ever read the Phantom? Oh, yes! How do you get caught in the doldrums? Have you heard of it? The Phantom Tollbooth? It's really, really neat. Did you ever see the movie? I mean, they try. It was actually a movie made by Chuck Jones. You know what that is? Who made all the Bugs Bunny cartoons? If I think about it, I'll let you borrow it. I did, I did burn a copy of it. Uh, I have copy. It's, have you ever heard of it? It is kind of fun. It's, it's a different kind of it. You know, sort of looks like... Uh, do you know what Disney animation looked like Chuck Jones? It was based on Chuck Jones? was The Emperor's New Groove. It didn't quite look like that, but a little different that kind of animation. I guess it is, yeah. yeah. You'd enjoy it. Every English reader should read it. Because what happens is, she, you heard it? Okay, she, she goes into a magic, he goes into a magic kingdom, and it's Digitopolis and Dictionopolis. And the letters and numbers are at war with each other. And because of that, rhyme and reason have been banished, and they've got to save them and bring them back together. So it's kind of a neat little you know, moral and stuff. But they also do the humbug. And uh, did, did you ever feel like you were that guy with the eyedropper moving the ocean? Oh, I didn't think about that. What happens is they, what is the evil guy that makes him do that? What's his name? Does he, does he like just have a head and a hat or something? Yeah, the faceless man. What it is properly called. The humbug? Is he the humbug? That's a different one. That's a different one. But basically, yeah, he, 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 he makes them do impossible deeds, or not so much impossible, but useless. So you're going to take a little dropper and move the ocean, or you're going to. Piece by piece, right? Right. See? And then cut down the tallest tree in the forest with a herring. Thank you. That's my Monty Python, the Holy Grail. You need to see that. You don't have to see Phantom Tobit, but you need to see Holy Grail if you're going to be in an English class. Right? Okay. So uh, again, they're 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 stuck. They can't move out. Uh, and then uh, you've probably heard this this phrase before: "Water, water everywhere, and all the boards did shrink." Water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink. Have you ever thought how psychologically horrible it would be to be in a boat in the middle of the ocean and die of thirst? 
Okay. okay. You can forever, yeah. Yeah, these, these are all your, your, your hidden fears, right? Your, your, your phobia, sort of. Hmm. To die, and why, just think about it. Why would it be so psychologically horrible to die of thirst? You're dying of thirst when you are surrounded by water, but of course it's salt water. And, in a way, like, yeah, you, you can't, I mean, that must be just so horrible, right? And I've heard that people say if you drink salt water, it makes you go crazy. I don't know if that's true. I've heard them say that. It certainly dries you out even more, of course, to drink the salt water. I don't know. Oh, that's true, yeah, you probably don't want to. Yeah, maybe, yeah. But I mean, this, the, 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 the dread of this, right? The very deep did rot, O Christ, that ever this should be. Yea, slimy things did crawl with legs upon the slimy sea. As if the water itself is rotting. Huh, probably, you know, you, you get, you'll get dead uh, animals coming to the top and all that sort of stuff. And, okay, I think what he has in mind here, in the Old Testament, what disease is meant partly to be an external embodiment of what sin does to your soul? Yeah, because what does leprosy do? It eats away at your skin and other things, but eats away. And in a way, it, it's, it's showing on the outside what that sin, rebellion, disobedience is doing to your soul. Eating it up. So, sort of like the picture of Dorian Gray showing us the state of his soul. Uh, and so, and oddly, in a little bit, he's going to actually use the word leprosy, interestingly enough. Uh, so, so everything's rotting. Uh, again, the absolute isolation of the Byronic hero, all alone, right? The, the dread, the over-self-consciousness of all of this horror. About, about, in real and route, the death fires danced at night. The water, like a witch's oils, burnt green and blue and white. It's lurid and odd and strange. I think all of you have probably read the Odyssey in one of your classes here. Uh, I don't know if you remember a scene, but it's, it's, he brings... The, uh, Telemachus brings this guy named Theoclimenus with him. He doesn't do much, but he's a prophet. He, he saves him, brings him there. And there's a scene where all of the... Uh, the suitors are eating and drinking and laughing, and he suddenly prophesies, and suddenly everything gets sort of dark and, and, and red and lurid. He says, like, ah, I can see the, your ghost going up and down and the blood. And, and all of a sudden, it's like this eerie, macabre thing. And then, does anybody know what the suitors do? Because they're idiots? And they laugh it off. We feel no sympathy for the suitors, really. We're not supposed to. Because they get killed. Okay, um... The, every tongue through utter drought was withered at the root. Imagine you're so dried out you can't even speak, right? Ah, well a day, what evil looks had I from old and young. Instead of the cross, the albatross about my neck was hung. Like a, like a scapegoat bearing his mark, bearing his cross. Uh, and so he's, you know, he's like a Christ figure, but he's, he's also done something evil. But he now has to bear the weight of everything that he's done, bear the weight of the shame. Ah, and then all of a sudden, uh, line uh, 153, up at the distance he sees a ship coming. A speck, a mist, a shape I wist, and still it neared and neared, as if it dodged a water sprite. It plunged and tacked and veered. It's moving, it's probably on the horizon, going up and down. With throats unslaked, with black lips baked, we could nor laugh nor wail, through utter drought, all dumb we stood. I bit my arm, I sucked the blood, and cried, A sail, a sail. Like the only way to wet his lips and mouth enough to be able to speak. So he becomes a vampire of himself. Scary? Yeah, self-vampire. <laughs> Feeding of himself. Um, is that a metaphor for the poet? Who has to sing out of his own pain? Biting and, you know. By the way, a poet doesn't have to be like that. That's an excessively romantic view of things. You don't have to be insane to be a good poet. Mm -hmm. um, thank, thank you for taking the place of Claire, right? I mean, taking the place of Maria. Claire, which means? What does Claire mean? It means light. Yeah, light, bright, clarity. Claire de Lune. Okay. So much more mystical than moonlight. And who wrote that? Uh, what's that guy's name? Yeah, yeah, WC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah.
Okay, they come, and then all of a sudden, the ship appears. Let's see, that page 453, uh, line 185. And at first it looks like that we realize it's basically a ghost ship. Are those her ribs through which the sun, I mean, again, it's like the ship is a skeleton. Do you remember what movie goes back and forth between skeletal and real depending on the mood? Remember Highs of the Caribbean? Wasn't that a great effect? Did that also freak you out? So eerie. Oh, that's right. Oh, that's right. The flying. I, I love. I love that. You know, the the, the, the guy with the snail helm and the head zips in and stuff like that. Ah! But it is right. It's the, the, the flying Dutchman. It's just wanders forever and it can never come to port again. Moving on, the strange ship, death ship, out of out of out of the Galveston Bay. Are those her ribs through which the sun did peer as to a grate? And is that woman all her crew? Is that a death? And are there two? Is death that woman's mate? And basically, we find out the male figure is death, and the female figure is death, life in death. Her lips were red, her looks were free, her locks were yellow as gold, her skin was as white as leprosy. The nightmare life in death was she who thicks man's blood with cold. I think I dated her in high school. Anyway, she's <laughs> sort of the female version of a Byronic hero. She's the band that, that she's La Belle Dame Saint Merci. We'll later read a poem by that name by Keats. You know what that means? La Belle Dame means the lovely lady without mercy. La Belle Dame Sans without mercy. What's that? Yeah, actually, that's a good point. That's true. She would be. All shall love me and despair. <laughs> it's a great moment. <laughs> um, the naked Hulk alongside came, and the twain, the two of them, were casting dice. The game is done, I've won, I've won, quoth she, and whistles thrice. They're actually dicing for the Mariner's soul. Anybody see a movie where someone plays chess with death? You ever heard of The Seventh Seal by Ingmar Bergman? Oh, you need to see that. Oh, it's a good one. Did I mention it before? Maybe. Yes, I it, it, it is. It is eerie. It's a wonderful sort of allegory. Um, I guess in a way they're doing something like that, aren't they? Yeah. That's right. I forgot. That's right. So that yeah, that that, that idea is a very old idea, right? Dicing uh, for these things. Oh yeah, they would they would they would take them and they would randomly choose one out of ten and, and beat them to death. And it's like, okay, that, that, that keeps discipline in the army. That keeps discipline. That's what I always hated about the military. They punish everybody. And sometimes sometimes uh, really, really tough coaches will do that. Like punish the whole team for somebody who did something wrong. It's, it's a way of getting team solidarity, but I, I still don't like that. Anyway. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's kicking them out, right? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Over the oh. Too, that the weak marine, that's that's right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. They want a good turn against him, and yeah, because yeah, everybody gets punished if, if one person. Does. Yeah, they, yeah. Basically, if you know one person shows cowardice, punish them all. You know. That's harsh, but I guess it works. I mean, you know what the idea is? The idea is your soldiers are more afraid of you than the enemy. That's basically going you know, to have the real strict pattern or something like that. Real strict. Wow. So, again, they're, 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 it's just so strange. It's, it's like something out of a, of a nightmare. But the whole point is we accept it. We're not going to be nitpicking about it. We've, we've moved. We've given our willy suspension of disbelief. We've accepted the illusion, and we've moved into a world where it just makes sense. It's just, it's just right. We don't, we don't have to question it. And, and I often like movies where they don't try to explain everything. Yeah. It works. Just accept it, okay? I love it because sometimes the explanations, I've seen this like in books and stuff like yeah. that. <laughs> the explanations are so bad. They just like. Yeah, I know, yeah. There was one really good series. Um, There's two books, and it was called Strange, the Dreamer, and the Muse of Nightmares. And it was Ooh. so cool. It was a really awesome fantasy world. And then at the end of the second book, they explained it, and it was some sort of alternate universe. Oh, I see. Thing, and it took us back to our world, and there was like science fiction. 
And I was just like, oh my gosh, it's yeah. beautiful, thing I know about it. That's what you like. Said, don't over, don't over explain it. Just, just accept it. This is it. That's 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 that's, that's what we give our willing suspension of disbelief. If it's done poorly, we don't. If we think they're trying to trick us or make us believe some ridiculous trick, but rather it just it just happens. Okay. There's no need to explain. Well, actually, we do find out in Narnia why the wardrobe is magic. Right? Because it was actually made out of the tree and all that. Uh, but other places, well, you know, there, there just happens to be a chink that allows those pirates to go through and Prince Caspian and there's doors in the air. There's, there, there just happens to be, uh, you know, passageways between our world and the other one. We just accept it. Uh, don't over explain. Right? right. Oh, that's true. Yeah. It's true, and it's better. But we just—it just makes sense. There should be a wood between the worlds, and we just accept it. And we and we, we accept the the restrictions that you can have paradise unless you say one wrong word, and then you lose it. You know. Yeah. Why 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 should why should poor Beauty's father get thrown in prison because he took a flower? Right? He was given everything, and he just took one rose. That's that's G. K. Chesterton says that, that that's how fairyland works. It's fragile. It's, it's like glass. glass. Glass is extremely strong, but also extremely fragile and shattered. Right? And that, that's what fairy is like, uh, he says in, in the book Orthodoxy that he wrote. Um, so, uh, again, all of it sort of crazy, right? And then basically it turns out that death won all of the other mariners, but life and death won the, our mariner, our, our narrator, the ancient mariner. And as he watches, and again, just imagine this. Whew, uh, starting, starting at line 211. One after one by the star dog moon, too quick for groan or sigh, each turned his face with a ghastly pang and cursed me with his eye. You imagine one by one they looked at him and then dropped dead. Imagine the psychological guilt. How does Frankenstein feel? William dies, Justine dies, Henry dies, his father dies, Elizabeth dies. I mean, one, one after another, all of these. Man. Uh, four, four times, times 50, 50 living men. Quick, how much is that? 200. Okay, so big shit. Yeah, that, that, that's a good answer. I don't, I don't deal with numbers. Four times 50 living men that I heard nor sigh nor groan. With heavy thump, a lifeless lump, they dropped down one by one. The souls did from their bodies fly. They fled to bliss or woe to their judged, whatever they are. Uh, and every soul that passed me by like the whiz of my cross. So, so increasing the what? The guilt. It's the guilt, right? Because he, he keeps, every time they zip, he's hearing the, the, the crossbow when he shot the albatross. Right? So more, talk about the Byronic hero being isolated and having no companionship at all. One by one, they drop dead. I imagine poor Walton all alone. Right. He's not going to be alone. He's going to go back, be reunited with his lovely sister. Uh, go back. Good, good. And then, because and he could, he could insist that they go on, right? But no, we're going to listen. I'm not going to be Frankenstein. Right? And then, I love it. Part four, is we haven't heard from the, from the wedding guests in a while. Oh, I fear thee, ancient mariner. I fear thy skinny hand. And, and thou art long, and lank, and brown, as is the ribbed sea sand. I fear thee, and thy glittering eye, and thy skinny hand so brown. What is he afraid of? He's a ghost, right? He says, fear not, fear not, thou wedding guest, this body drop not down. You see, in a sense, our wedding guest is still living in the world of innocence, right? Uh, and... Our mariner has come back from the world of experience, and this is almost too much for him. No, I, I can't take this. I didn't know such things existed. Right? I'm terrified. The uh, whew, he thinks it's a ghost, um, and and uh, and uh, again, in many ways, I, I think of the wedding guest as being like Walton, right? in the same way Walton is trying to understand this this Franca. Can you imagine being Walton? Your eyes would just keep getting bigger and bigger until they're like exploding. Right? Anybody ever read the fairy tale when the guy strikes the tinderbox and the dog comes to help him? Yes, and they're 
the big eyes, and then he goes to the next one, and the eyes are like the size of towers. Towers are wheel, wagon, wagon wheels. They just keep getting bigger. This is a famous, uh, it's called the Tinderbox. Yeah. 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 You, do you know the story? You ever heard it? It's a famous. Uh, yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you get this magic help, and uh, pretty cool. Do you feel any, any, any? Do you feel any guilt for the witch that he just kills? <laughs> well, she was trying to trick him, but I think in those fairy tales, the general implication is the witch is doing something bad. That's right. They're just evil. Yeah. So if you're a bad witch, then that's the consequence. No, it doesn't. But the bad witch. He's tough. Gets there, it falls into her own tracks, sort of way. Like that, that's true, yeah, that is, yeah. Oh, Jafar, or, or, or just the Snow White. I don't know about the movie, but Alan Kaplan is a whole track. He's victorious. Wait, wait. Oh. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> fairy tales. Did you grow up on fairy tales? No. You did. What about you, Sophia? Did you have any fairy tales growing up? Arabian Nights or anything like that? Uh, I... Greek mythology? Uh, no, no, mythology. These stories. We've got to bring these back. You know, you grow up in these stories. It's just great. Anyway. Oh, yeah. True. So, uh, I, again, is that a ghost? But... Again, here's another expression, sort of an ultimate expression of the alienation and isolation of the ironic hero. Alone, alone, alone all, all alone, alone on a wide, wide sea, and never a saint took pity on my soul. Just think of, you know, Frankenstein of the monster, all alone, completely isolated. The many men so beautiful, and they all dead did lie. And a thousand, thousand slimy things lived on, and so did I. Um, this is how you feel if you're living in the girl's dorm after a, a thunderstorm, after a flood. Yeah, I mean, slimy things. Are, uh, I guess the boys are always worse. I guess you're safer. Oh, the bugs. I've, I've heard people see rats, too, in the dorms, I've heard. Have you seen them? You heard that? Yeah, yeah, but anyway, watch, watch out. It's just, yeah. <laughs> But look at that. I looked upon the rotting sea, and the sea can rot with the creatures dying and coming up, right? I looked upon the rotting sea and drew my eyes away. I looked upon the rotting deck, and there the dead men lay. I looked to heaven and tried to pray, but or ever a prayer had gushed, a wicked whisper came and made my heart. He can't even pray. He can't break out of himself. He's caught inside of himself. He's got his own little crisis going on here. Can somebody identify these lines? My words go up. My thoughts remain below. Words without thoughts never to heaven go. It's a terrible irony. It's somebody who's at prayer, and because he's at prayer, somebody loses his... Yeah, it's Hamlet. Why does Hamlet not kill Claudius in that moment? Yeah, he's afraid he's repenting and praying and he'll go right to heaven, heaven and not have to go to purgatory. But I don't know if you understand, it's ironic because we find that at the end he's not praying. In other words, Hamlet could have killed him. I, I, I may be using words, but my thoughts are down here. They never go to heaven. So there's a terrible irony there that he could have killed him and he lost, he lost his opportunity. Instead, like eight people die instead of one. I guess, yeah. Sad. As Lawrence Olivier said, the tragedy of a man who could not make up his mind. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the, um, so he tries, but he can't break out of himself. He's trapped within himself and with his own guilt, and he can't even find, you know, repent. We like, we don't, we don't really see Frankenstein or the monster really try, like go to a priest and repent or something like that. They're stuck within their own guilt. Right? Yeah, and that's the point. And, and, you know, okay, there are people who believe they're too good for Christ. But there are people who also believe they're too bad for him. But you're right, that is a kind of pride. I am such a chief of sinners that nobody can even forgive me. That, that actually is a, a pride, a false humility that's pride. Uh, and yeah, that, that would be a good one. And that's why they, they, they will never 
Except this is why I always, you know, love. I was always a Star Trek, Star Trek fan. But Star Trek, the people in Star Trek could never become Christian because they're always finding like an Eden place and they always destroy it. You know, they they, they, they just can't. They, they, it's an amazing thing. But um, ah, sad. Um, I closed my lids and kept them closed, and the balls like pulses beat for the sky and the sea and the sea and the sky lay like a load on my weary eye, and the dead were at my feet. Oh my gosh, it's isolation. The cold sweat melted from their limbs, nor rot nor reek did they. The look with which they looked on me had never passed away. It's still there. Oh, man. An orphan's curse would drag to hell a spirit from on high. But oh, more horrible than that is the curse in a dead man's eye. Seven days, seven nights I saw that curse, and yet I could not die. The Byronic hero just wants oblivion. Stop. I'd rather not know anymore, but they, they, they've gone past that, and they can't just die. <laughs> Moves on. And then, watch what happens. It's so beautiful. A little farther line, 271. Beyond the shadow of the ship, I watched the water snakes. They moved in tracks of shining white, and when they reared, the elfish light fell off in hoary flakes. Within the shadow of the ship, I watched their rich attire, blue, glossy green, and velvet black. They coiled and swam, and every track was a flash of golden fire. You know, this should be sort of disgusting, right? But it makes it strange and weird. And, oh, happy living things, no tongue their beauty might declare. A spring of love gushed from my heart, and I blessed them unaware. Sure, my kind saint took pity on me, and I blessed them unaware. The self-same moment I could pray, and from my neck so free, the albatross fell off and sank like lead into the sea. And as the gloss tells us, uh, the spell begins to break. What has he finally been able to do? What, what starts the breaking of the spell? What's he doing here? What he blesses the water state. Good. Something so he's moved out of himself to bless something that's not beautiful like the albatross, right? But something that's kind of you know beautiful, but in, you know in a strange way, you know, like like a you know, like a bulldog that's so ugly it's cute, you know that kind of stuff. Or baby Yoda. Anybody like baby Yoda? Okay. Oh, you gotta watch this. Baby Yoda. Yeah, that's a good point. I guess <laughs> in comparison, it's beautiful. Ooh, they're weird. I mean, you know, like some insects. Think of dragonflies, which are scary in one way, but the color, the kind of green sheen, is really strange. That's the word, incandescent. It's really strange, and beautiful, and odd, and, and uh, it's, it's it's weird. You know, it's like uh, oh, beautiful. Yeah. yeah, the two cans and things like that. And uh, weren't you excited when you discovered that all those fish in, in uh, Finding Nemo are real fish? There really are clown fish and stuff like that, but they're, they're a little bit smaller. If you see them, they're real small, but those tropical fish are colorful and things. Really cool. Anyway, so he does. He's able to bless another living creature, an animal, one of the lowest uh, kind of animals, and yet he blesses it. And he says, my saint must have helped me, must have opened up that, that wall that was preventing me from moving out of myself. Now, here is a great stanza that I hope as, as students you can identify with. Oh, sleep, it is a gentle thing, the love from pole to pole. To Mary, Queen, the praise be given. She sent the gentle sleep from heaven that slid into my soul. You feel like you just want to go to sleep right now for a while? Did you finish your paper? Just to sleep for a good long time. Have you ever like thought of, of heaven as just like a big bed? Sometimes. It's... Does anybody know? He said, he said, death is one of two things. Either a long eternal sleep without dreams and who wouldn't change that for anything or we'll move to another higher realm you know what that's what Socrates says at the end of the apology I don't fear death it's one of two things I can imagine I guess how that kind of feeling of relaxation after relaxation a really long or stressful day when you're able to get in the bed and you not just like mentally relaxed but you yeah. feel all your tense muscles that's nice whether writing or reading or whatever 
just feel that relaxed. You know that for the next few hours or whatever, you don't have responsibilities. You can just keep up. I don't have insomnia. For people who have these problems, I imagine that's more intense. Oh, terrible. There's like, you do reach those moments where you're like, I'm so tired. I know I will sleep. Into the hands of? You know you're going into the hands of? Morpheus? Morpheus, you got it. That's the phrase. Into the hands of Morpheus. Uh, not, 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 uh, not the character in The Matrix. Uh, Leonard, Leonard Fishburne. Uh, no, Le- Fishburne. Lawrence Fishburne. Lawrence Fishburne. The, uh... <laughs> anyway. The, uh, 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 what was it? Those crazy movies, uh, Oh, I can't remember now. Yeah, anyway, but uh, funny joke. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't articulate it. But anyway, um, but you know, look what happens. The silly buckets on the deck that had so long remained, I dreamt that they were filled with dew, and when I awoke, it rained. What character in the Bible did God put into a deep sleep and then did something? Yeah, Adam. They removed the rib. Now, does anybody know what Milton adds to that? Same thing, he puts, puts Adam to sleep and he removes the rib and makes Eve. That while, while Adam was sleeping, he dreamed of Eve and when he woke, he found it true. That's certainly what Coleridge has in mind. And also, uh, in one of the letters of John Keats, John Keats said famously, imagination is like Adam's dream. He woke to find it true. I mean, did you ever think about it? If when you dreamed, okay, let's say you dreamed something today, and then you woke up, and then the next night you dreamed, and when you dreamed, you picked up literally where you left off, but for more than just one day, probably, or more than one day, lucid dreaming, if you really, don't you think your dream life will become more real than your real life? Weird. The Chinese, or I think it's the Japanese, tell the story of the man who fell asleep and dreamt he was a butterfly. And when he woke up, he no longer knew if he was a man dreaming he was a butterfly. Or a butterfly dreaming he was a man. You read that? Yes, I read that. Cool. I think it's Japanese. I read it in a book of Japanese stories. Yeah. Yeah, it's a Japanese thing, yeah. And then there's a story. It's a, there's a book called... Uh, Kaidan by this guy named Lafcadio Hearn, and they collected. That's where I read it. They made a movie of some of the stories. It's beautiful. You see that movie, K W A I D A N, Kaidan. Scary Japanese ghost story. <laughs> um, anyway, so suddenly he's, he's just drenched with the dew, and life is returning to him, right? Um, and it's starting to move, and then look what happens a little bit farther down, uh, page 456, it's line uh, 326. All of a sudden, the loud wind never reached the ship, yet now the ship moved on. Beneath the lightning and the moon, the dead men gave a groan. They groaned, they stirred, they all uprose, nor spake nor moved their eyes. It had been strange, even in a dream, to have seen those dead men rise. The helmsman steered, the ship moved on, yet ne'er, never a breeze up blew. The mariners all again worked the ropes where they were wont to do. They raised their limbs like lifeless tools. We were a ghastly crew. And again, I fear the ancient mariner. Be calm, thou wedding guest. It was not those souls that fled in pain which to their courses came again, but a troop of spirits blessed. So for a moment, in other words, the dead haven't risen. Angels animate the body so that they can sail. Isn't that weird? The dance macabre we talked about before. The strange dance of the dead. See, one of the things about the Byronic character, I didn't quite put this in your outline, but you can sort of see it, especially with Frankenstein, is sometimes when you stepped out of that circle, when you stepped out of where your limits are supposed to be and cross over, oftentimes you see things of great horror and terror but you also see things of great beauty because right? you've stepped out and, and there's more extreme. And a, a perfect example of that is the North Pole, which would be absolutely beautiful and yet a wasteland. But basically, might as well be a desert. Although, of course, you can eat the snow. Um, carefully, just don't eat the yellow snow, right? So, yeah, but, but, but I mean, so it isn't really, actually, oddly enough, that the ocean is more desert than, than the frozen one. Um, but the uh, snow. Would you like to see some snow this Christmas? Do you remember the 
the snow when it snowed. Oh, you you would know you were too young because now you're young enough. But, the, but when it snowed on Christmas Eve. Oh. We also grew up with Virginia. Oh, then you start thinking about that. Virginia. Do you miss Virginia and the seasons? Yes. I miss the whole. I miss the seasons. Yes. The leaves and stuff like that. Yeah. I had some strange friend who's like a fan of my books, and he came to visit Houston, and he brought with him like a bunch of grass and leaves from the East Coast to remind me. I'm like, you're lucky you didn't get stopped by security. Think it was, you know, marijuana or something. And they, you know, he got it through somehow. That was it. It was cool. I thought, thank you. I mean, they were leaves. They were different colors. Really funny dude. Anyway, strange. But but again, we see that the two extremes of horror and beauty because we've stepped in. I mean, in a sense, we've become like a god, but we also see the horror of it, but we see the beauty. Um, and, and again, we can't go back to the horror. Uh, so they, they keep moving on, they keep moving on, uh, and uh, let's, let's keep moving. Um, uh, they, 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 they keep moving and moving, uh, and then, uh, let me see. Uh, oh, let's jump down to, uh, let's jump down to page 458. I, I want to read all of this. I mean, it's beautiful. The, the, the song, it's like a heavenly choir. They're singing. Oh, it's beautiful stuff, right? And then all of a sudden, the ship lurches, and this would be line 389. Then like a pawing horse let go, she made a sudden bound. It flung the blood into my head, and I fell down in a swound. And so he, in other words, he faints. It falls into a trance. Uh, uh, what character goes on a journey and he faints twice in the beginning of the journey and then he learns to toughen himself up. Hey Dante, right? He, he faints twice because he needs to harden himself against the sin. Uh, yeah, get over it. That's right. Don't be, don't be weeping at those whom God is justly condemned. Ah, things want to see. Why am I doing this? Uh, all of that stuff. How long in that same fit I lay I have not to declare but ere my living life returned, I heard and in my soul discerned two voices in the air. Two spirits. Is it he, quoth one? Is this the man by him who died on cross? It's kind of weird that we've got these spirits out of fantasy land talking about Jesus dying on the cross. It's an interesting mixture of things. With his cruel bow, he laid full low the harmless albatross. And we're starting to see the horror. The spirit who biddeth, the spirit who biddeth by himself in the land of mist and snow... Uh, what's his name? Um, that's what uh, Walton says in his letter to his sister. I have gone to the land of mist and snow, but don't worry, I will not kill an albatross. Okay, so he's mixing those two together. Um, he loved the bird that loved the man who shot him with his bow. So there's a spirit who loves that. We now find out that the albatross actually loved the mariner, which makes it even worse. Like Al he was talking about. You know, biting, biting the hand that feeds you, and Adam and Eve take take the forbidden fruit. Um, and uh, so, 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 again, anyway, um, who shot him with the bow? The other was a softer voice, as soft as honeydew. Quoth he, the man hath penance done, and penance more will do. That finished. He's going to continue on his penance, and then all of a sudden, look what they do. It says, uh, uh, page four fifty nine, uh, line four twenty five. The, the air is cut away before and closes. For, okay. They're, they're about to take the mariner back home. But it's like on the other side of the world. So they need to make it go super fast. And we would say, modern day, they basically form a vacuum around the ship. So it goes faster than human life could sustain. And that's why they had to put him into a trance. Right? Into a state. We would say a state of suspended animation. Right? Because otherwise he would suffocate, it seems. It's cool, you know? Whoosh, super fast, all the way back to his home country. He says, uh, uh, then, then uh, okay, let, let, let's, let's turn to uh, still the same page, line 434. Okay, as they're, okay, as they're getting almost back home, then we need to get rid of those dead bodies. Okay? And this is what happens. Again, beautiful and terrifying at the same time. It says, all stood together, okay, the dead men stood together, then it says, all stood together on the deck for a charnel dungeon fitter, all fixed on me their stony eyes that in the moon did glitter. And they're just looking at him. This, can you imagine how eerie that would be? All the dead have stood up and looking at you. But, 
the pain, the curse which they died, had never passed away. I could not draw my eyes from theirs, nor turn them up to pray. So then, but then, and now this spell was snapped. Find it. The curse is expiated, sort of. Okay. Uh, and now this spell was snapped. Once more, I viewed the ocean green and looked far forth, yet little saw of what had else been seen. Like one that on a lonesome road doth walk in fear and dread, and having once turned round, walks on and turns no more his head, because he knows a frightful fiend doth close behind him dread. Have you ever felt that way? Walking through Houston, and it's like there's somebody, and then you look, and then you're too afraid to look, and you keep moving faster and faster. By the way, have you heard that stanza? You just read it in Frankenstein. Right after Frankenstein creates the monster, and then he runs away from it, he fears it's following him, and he quotes exactly that stanza. Go back and look, it's towards the beginning. Uh, really, really cool. The fear of what's behind you. But don't look back. Are you fans of the movie uh, Quiet? Quiet? The Quiet Place. Oh, you got to see it. There's a new one out here again, but uh, I, I thought it was good. Ooh, eerie. Um, but soon... There breathed a wind on me, nor sound nor motion made. Its path was not upon the sea, its ripple or in shade. It raised my hair, it fanned my cheek like a meadow gale of spring. It mingled strangely with my fears, yet it felt like a welcoming. Life is coming back. Then breathe that the God, God is sending. Swiftly, swiftly flew the ship, yet she sailed. So you see, first it was water, water everywhere, alone, alone. It's, it's sort of a refrain that comes back. Uh, and, she and she sailed, she, yet she sailed softly too. Sweetly, sweetly blew the breeze, on me alone it grew. grew. Oh, dream of joy, is this indeed the lighthouse top I see? Is this the hill? Is this the kirk? Is this mine own country? It's come home. They've done it. The spirits have all done it in one night. Come on, you don't recognize that? No, that's a good guess. What day is this? What? That's what day it is? The spirits have all done it. In one it's a Christmas carol, right? Because he thinks it's been long, but he wakes up to Christmas Day. It's not too late. Because they've done it all in one night. Even though it's supposed to be different nights, it's all happened in one night. Um, he's come home. We drifted o'er the harbor bar, and I with sobs did pray, Oh, let me be awake, my God, or let me sleep all day. Isn't that beautiful? What he's saying is, if I'm awake right now, never let me sleep again. But if I'm asleep and dreaming, Never let me wake again. You can tell Preston, that's a good line to use on his girlfriend. Yeah. Beautiful. Is your, is your boyfriend that romantic? Would you think up for something romantic to say like that? <laughs> that's your. I get that's a loving act, I suppose, yeah. Most guys wouldn't want to do that. There we go. It's a loving act. <laughs> really, very, very nice. Um, okay, he says. Um, now they, they come over, uh, and then they start to leave. Right? It says, uh, uh, "Where is it?" Um, line four eighty-five. A little distance from the prow, those crimson shadows were. I turned my eyes upon the deck. Oh Christ! What saw I there? Each course lay flat, lifeless and flat. And by the holy rood, a man all light, a seraph man on every course there stood. This seraph man each waved his hand. It was a heavenly sight. They stood as signals to the land, each one. And like the ghost and, and off it goes. Like a, kind of a resurrection weird, but it's not right. You know, and off it goes. All these strange things. And then he comes back to the port, right? And then in, notice that there's seven parts in this. Okay. You know, in a lot of mystical things, there's rituals. It, usually it's either three or seven. Uh, seven is a magic. Okay. The, the, the important numbers in the Bible are three and four, right? Three, would three be the number of God or man? So it's the number of God. Four is sort of the human number, the, you know, the four corners of the globe and all that sort of stuff, the four seasons. So three is kind of the divine. And if you add three and four, you get seven. But if you multiply three and four, you get twelve. Oh, you get it that time, okay? And those are both very important numbers in the Bible, seven and twelve, right? So seven here... It, 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 I mean, he's going through a spiritual journey. Of, of, instead of three steps, it's seven steps. And he's moved into the last, almost like a 12-step program. Uh, but it's a seven step. The number of God is three, and the number of man is four. And the dance of the universe is a halt. Is it three, four times? Oh, cool! Now, that's really cool. I, just, just think that, man. That's cool. Wow. Three-quarter halts. 
I like it. You know, I'm amazed at how many people can come up with something different on the walls. You would think they all set would sound the same. But it's amazing how much they can do it. What seems like such a... Well, it's like a sonnet or something. Um, waltzes. Some things are waltzes. Yeah. There's some things are waltzes we don't even realize they're waltzes sometimes. Oh, my God, that's just quarter time. Woo! Um, okay, uh, so... We, we switch and we meet a hermit. This is like something you would see out of Wordsworth. And it's a hermit that sits there and loves to talk to sailors. You remember the preacher in Moby Dick who tells his, his sermon? And he, he, he's, he's got, a, he's got a, a, a sermon where his, what do you call that thing? It looks like the prow of the ship. And that's where he goes up to give his sermon. So if you remember that. Anyway, it's kind of cool. So uh, he there and, and, and uh, it, it comes over and, and uh, he comes over and then they take him in the boat. And, and he starts rowing, rowing the boat. It's going to be wild. And uh, if, you, if you pick up line, page 463, line 574, he says, Oh, shreve me, shreve me, holy man. You know what that means? You're, ask, you're asking him to hear my confession. Like, like Shrove Tuesday. Hear my confession. Right? And it's really interesting. Whenever the Romantics do a really fantastical thing, they always give it kind of a Catholic setting. Most of the major romantics were not Catholic. They were from Protestant background. Whether they were believers, they were from Protestant. But they, I think they, there's more strangeness in that. So there's a lot of mention of Mary and all. Yeah, it's more mystic. It really is. Right? And, uh, and uh, so he says, The hermit crossed his brow. Means he did his cross. Quoth he, I bid thee say what manner of man art thou. Tell me your story. Now look what happens. Forthwith this frame of mine was wrenched with a woeful agony which forced me to begin my tale and then it left me free. Since then and at an uncertain hour that agony returns until my ghastly tale is told this heart within me burns. I pass like night from land to land. I have strange power of speech. That moment that his face I see I know the man that must hear me to him my tale I speak. So this is his lifelong penance. He must travel the globe never, never having a home and he tells his story to people, right? You could say that this is the curse of the poet, in a way, especially the romantic poet, who travels, and his life is his poem, and his poem is his life. And he travels place to place. I imagine Tartan. Uh, not Tartan, what am I saying? Daniel. Remember Daniel? When? <laughs> Tartan's an old student of mine. He's like Daniel. Daniel, right? <laughs> I miss that guy. Anyway, the, um, yeah, he comes like, the office around me up. Anyway. He's compelled to speak, he, and that's his penance to tell his story, right? And he tells his story again and again, and he holds on to them and won't let them go. And that, I mean, that, that's just, again, his, his penance is his life. Uh, and then he said, let me finish quick, line four, eight, five, six, a wedding guest, his soul hath been alone in a wide, wide sea, so lonely twas that God himself scarce seemed there to be. He was truly lost and isolated. But this is a Byronic hero who has a sort of happy ending. He still has a lifelong penance, but he has a happy ending. Oh, sweeter than the marriage feast, tis sweeter far to me to walk together to the kirk, the church, with a goodly company, to walk together to the kirk and all together pray, while each to his great father bends, old men and babes and loving friends and youths and maidens gay. He's finally learned the beauty of fellowship, of community. So he loves going to church even more than the, the wedding. Which you think would be better, right? But here, no. I've, I broke my fellowship, and now I recognize it. But he, he's not part of it anymore. Right? He lives in the borders or margins of society. Uh, anybody ever heard of the myth of the wandering Jew? It's an old legend that while Jesus was being taken to the cross, this, this Pharisee heckled him. And Jesus said to him, you will remain until I return. And this wandering Jew is somebody who's been alive for 2,000 years. He can't die. He wanders, hiding in the margins. He can't die until Christ returns. Right? Uh, interesting, interesting story. I read of the one they referenced the wandering Jew, like the end of the evil. And some people see it as a metaphor for the Jewish people, right? Who always were being kicked out of one place to another, all the different pogroms and stuff that happened to them. And, and yet, they persist. They're still here. Uh, and anyway, it's a fascinating story. Person that can't die. Uh, farewell, farewell, but this I tell to thee, thou wedding guest, he prayeth well who loveth well both man and bird and beast. He prayeth best who loveth best all things both great and small for the dear God who loveth us he made and loveth all. Uh, wasn't there a, a, a novel uh, about the veterinarian? It's called All Things Bright and Beautiful. Anyway. Oh, well, yeah. Thanks for this. 
That's why they have long things. It's beautiful stuff. See, it's a wonderful stuff. You see this in this modern cynical age. There are still young people who memorize. Oh, this is cool. You don't have the entire. I mean, I write a poem here, memorize. I did once when I was a kid. Listen, my children. Oh, let's memorize this. Anyway, I, 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 I got to let you. But let me just get because I can leave at the end here. So. He, he says, says he now realizes, realizes that all that lives is holy. That's a line from Blake. That everything's full of blessing. But the mariner whose eye is bright, whose beard with age is hoar, is gone. He can't go to the wedding feast. He's still an outside. He didn't even go to the church. He's just gone. He's, he can't, but he comes. But look what happens to him. Uh, the wedding guest turns. He leaves. He doesn't go. He went like one that hath been stunned and is of sense forlorn. A sadder and a wiser man. He rose the morrow morn. So. Our wedding guest has passed from what state to what state? Innocent, but he's done it without having to become a Byronic hero. So he's walted. He has grown up, he's learned, but without having to do something terrible and suffer like the mirror. And that's what all parents want their children. So they can learn without having learned the hard ways. We still use that phrase. Why do we have to learn the hard way? So the sadder but wiser. I'll, I'll end with a... Uh, 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 a uh, a, a question for those of you that like musicals. Who sings the song, The Sadder But Wiser Girl is the girl for me. The Sadder But Wiser Girl for me. You ever seen The Music Man? Oh. You didn't like The Music Man? Thought he was too much of a swindler? Although he changes at the end. Oh. I'm watching it again. It's, it's got beautiful. It's, it's unique because it's one of the only musicals, if you know anything about musicals,